Okay, welcome everybody to uh, today's uh, webinar for the Open Education Special Interest Group and we have a conversation with the lovely Helen Beetham about the Open Covid for Education Pledge which I'm going to pass over now to my equally lovely colleague Teresa and uh, she will kick things off for us. Thanks very much. Thanks Deb, that's wonderful. Thank you for uh, a lovely introduction too. And I'm delighted to have Helen joining us because this, I think, is the most exciting in, um, idea, inspired idea that has come forward recently. Um, and it is very much of the moment. We're all living through a pandemic, as you probably don't need to be reminded. Um, but what can we do? The first thing we, we that happened to us all, and I'm sure we're all in, this, in the same boat on this one, is we lost of agency. We couldn't we, what we what we couldn't understand is what we could do for the best. And I think Helen has come forward with a wonderful idea that will help us uh, to get our thoughts together. I know some of you have already signed the pledge uh, and we'll find out more about it in just a few moments. So very quickly, before we let Helen get started, um, just a reminder of how to get your um, audio and video working. We really hope you're going to join in and this will be a conversation. So feel free to do that and uh, I will make sure that everybody has uh, access to their mics um, so that you can do that. There will be some polls as well as we go along, um, which I hope I'll, I'll remember how to set up. We'll <laughs> try that as we go along. So a quick word about who we are. So the Open Education Special Interest Group, this is our mission here. And as you can see, we are very much seeking to remove barriers to education. Um, and anything that helps us do that um, including the pledge, um, is very much in our remit. We want to support, develop, sustain and influence policy in open education and in education in general. And, and today's session really picks up from uh, one of the discussions that we've had earlier within the SIG, which was a, a discussion around values. Um, and this little uh, slide comes from that, which was back in 2017. We had a really positive engagement as a result of that discussion. And we're picking up from there and moving on. So I wanted just to remind ourselves of the discussion that we had there. And uh, you will still be able to find those hashtags, I think, around in, the, in cyberspace. So we're going to uh, move on now to Helen, an introduction to Helen. What I'm really, really pleased about is Helen has such a lot of expertise and uh, we really need to um, take a lead from Helen and the conversation she's been having and uh, find out where she feels we could, um, where we could as a community support and develop open education at this particular moment in time. So Helen, I'm going to pass over to you. Thank you, Teresa. Can I check you can hear me okay? Yes, all good, thank you. Oh, yeah. Great. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. But in all honesty, the only reason I'm um, here, this side, is because I'm not there doing the doing. Um, I have got this position slightly to the side at the moment of the um, of the um, alt kind of uh, on the ground community, the grassroots community, which for, for no, if nothing else has given me this um, a little bit of space, um, hopefully to do something that can just amplify and um, network all the amazing work that's already going on with people in this community. And very much what the pledge is about is not doing anything new, starting from these values that we all share and hold dear and just seeing if in this particular moment there are ways we could enhance, promote um, those values uh, and reach out perhaps to people for whom they haven't seemed like the basis of their practice until now, but hopefully might start to. So um, this, uh, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted that all to the people host, hosting the, the pledge and uh, Marin, Martin and Fiona in office have done amazing work to make it possible. So I just want to make sure that, um, that they get fully, fully acknowledged. So before we go any further, Teresa um, mentioned that some people have signed the pledge. This is in no way to um, to name and shame because in some ways the difficulties people might have in signing something like this should be part of our conversation and I really want to be open to that. But I thought it would be interesting just to know from the beginning who or their organisation or you as an individual 
have signed the pledge at this moment in time. Teresa, do you have the problem at all? Yeah, that's what I was just looking for. So I think we're going to go through the chat at the moment. Brilliant. OK, that's cool. um, so if we chat. can pop a yes or no into the chat, that will be really helpful. And uh, try and get an idea and um, the I'll put the link in the chat as well um, to that pledge to remind people what it actually involves. And I think the point of doing this, um, particularly anonymously, which was the hope, is um, really just to raise the question as to um, why it might be a thing that you've had signed or, you know, why it might be a conversation you'd had and decided not to sign. Because I've had conversations with people in organisations that have uh, chosen not to sign it. I'm hoping, and they've said that the conversation they had around signing it did move things on a little way. So I guess that's just a way to signal that, you know, a pledge is a very lightweight thing, really. It's it's a lever for, for real criticism, for real action. And what I'm hoping to get from this community, knowing how engaged you all are at the real grassroots of this, is what that leverage in action might look like, rather than promoting, you know, a little badge to wear or a flag to wave, which uh, there's a real danger of something like this could be. So please continue to share, you know, why you have or haven't signed it, you know, and what that process was like. Um, I've got one more um, poll for us. And again, uh, chat window, and if we're doing it in the chat window, of course, then I expect other to be the dominant app. But given we haven't got long together, and I really want to respect all of our lunch breaks and all of our time at the end of the week, um, what would you like to see us move forward um, in this time that we've got together? What would you like to, to hear more about? I've made some suggestions and you can just use a number as a um, as a shorthand if you want to, or just say a little bit in the chat window about what you hope to get out of the next uh, 30 minutes or so. So one of the things that's coming up in the chat window is that adding the logo is the key conversation and that's something that's really come up from the people who've signed so far that signing it as an individual is fantastic and it gives you that kind of connection to a wider community arguing for your logo to be included is a whole other conversation and um, as Catherine said she had to go through that process um, in order to allow the logo to be used um, and Scott's saying that's a conversation to be had and I agree that is a conversation that can be can be difficult to have um, and it's one reason why we thought quite carefully about having that step in there as a way of slightly forcing the issue, I guess, within organisations. And what organisation means, my imagination at the beginning of this was that would be something like a department or a service team. But it might be a whole institution, a whole university. And we haven't we haven't got to that point with any UK universities yet, although we do have some universities overseas that have signed up with their whole organisation behind it, which is incredible. The, the logo, just as in sort of corporate branding and everything else, tends to have a whole um, series of barriers and wraps around it. Um, so I can understand why people would feel that that's uh, not as straightforward as it might seem. And certainly at, at the practitioner level, it's, uh, it's a much easier thing to do. Um, it's been good to see open source companies signing up, some open source companies, and it's also good to see um, some uh, publishing, um, educational publishing companies, research publishing, for example, signing the pledge. I think from the point of view of um, if we look to uh, Edinburgh University and their work with open education and the work that Lorna um, Lorna Campbell does, we can see the reputational enhancement that has come as a result of going open. Uh, so I think there are many, many powerful reasons why having that conversation can be pushed forward. Teresa and Liz, I really appreciate what you're saying there and hopefully this, uh, this conversation we have now can really tease out that tension between not doing things just because they're a token, but also making them easy to do. So um, I've put back the slide with the actual pledge on. Um, I'm getting the idea that people quite liked number three. So uh, Theresa, maybe we could I'll just hide those. Um, so the pledge was deliberately quite lightweight and designed to be something people could step into. 
as in stepping into the open community rather than um, carrying with it a whole load of other values that as open educators ourselves we might subscribe to as well it's a very lightweight kind of piece of piece of um uh, of promise and so liz i can totally see why that might seem that might make it less valuable to some people who've been doing open educational practice for many many years i really hope though that it can also have value to people who are a long way on i think along the process so if people want to talk about things to do together I want to make this a really open discussion. I've got some things to say about each of the four things that are on here. But what I thought I'd do um, is go through where we're up to with the pledge a little bit with a few slides. I'm really happy to skip that if everybody feels that they are uh, totally understand what it's about and where it's come from. Um, so uh, maybe you could just indicate with a with a smiley or a raised hand if you think I should go back to the beginning a little bit before we move forward again together. I think for the purposes of the recording, it would be really helpful to have that just a quick summary um, because not everybody's been able to make it on a Friday lunchtime, if you don't mind, Helen. Of course I do. So um, some of you may know that there is an open COVID pledge and this was developed for the, uh, the medicine and healthcare community and is actually hosted by Creative Commons on this website that I've put up here. And they've put quite a lot of, well, a lot of resource into this as it's really taken off. So they've um, they've got uh, part of the site which is about making the pledge, which we also have. But then they've got the things that organisations are doing in support, and they've got this kind of featured IP part where they look at the kinds of things that are being released under the pledge and how they're being used and what value they're having in in um, tackling the the COVID crisis. So I guess the um, the things I took from that, seeing how effective it was being, was that having a common goal, which we do at the moment in uh, tackling the COVID crisis, you know, it's kind of brought everyone together to understanding this crisis facing humanity. And in that kind of situation, open makes a huge amount of sense. It allows collaboration to happen more quickly. People can see what's already going on and can, can fill in their piece. They can play to their strengths. And I guess in those kind of convivial networks, new information can share incredibly rapidly. So there was a point about the moment that made open more effective as an approach to doing science, healthcare, public health, um, medicine. And what that meant was that new people were seeing the case for open that perhaps hadn't seen it before. Um, and some of that is a, kind of a, a, a very welcome moral pressure. You know, I think um, knowledge, valuable knowledge that can save lives should not be used for, for commercial gain. That seems to be a, a value that everyone can kind of agree on, at least um, at its most basic level, at a time when people ran under are suffering and, and dying from a, a common um, human disease. And I guess the other thing is that as the fallout from COVID has become clearer in every sector, including education, um, it's a moment when real change is suddenly possible. Now, those of us who've been around open education will be wary of the clarion calls about um, disruptive and transformational change, that that, that can mean many, many things. Um, but there is no doubt the moment for change is here and we could take it in a whole number of different directions. And as the open community, I guess we want that moment, that pivot to be an open pivot, um, not just an online pivot. We want to pivot to new ways of imagining education is possible rather than um, uh, simply signing up for some of the more disruptive technologies that have come to the fore at this time. And I suppose for me, part of that is noticing that in every sphere where I'm active, that sense of shared humanity and care for each other is coming to the fore in ways that perhaps it wasn't before. And so that discourse about care, which the open community has been having for many years, um, is a little bit more, uh, is landing a little bit more softly. So I noticed all of that going on in that community around the open COVID pledge for medicine and healthcare. And then I thought, I, I thought and spoke to a few people, and I spoke to Creative Commons about whether the kinds of things we're learning in education at the present time around the, the open um, education kind of pivot, but also around things like how to open campuses safely and the kinds of rebuilding of our organisations that we see as necessary, whether they could also be shared under this same pledge. And, you know, their view and, and to some extent mine was that actually the open education community is different. The open education is different because, for example, we've been doing open in lots of different ways for many years. It, it means different things. There are different actors here. There's already a huge amount of very, very, very um, valuable organisations, some of which have signed up, many of which have signed up to the pledge, which is great. 
um, we already have kind of public um, values work, the open, the Cape Town Open Declaration, the kind of values work Teresa was talking about. We have conferences and events that promote open. So there was kind of a case for doing open education slightly differently and thinking about maybe a, a parallel piece needed. Um, one that recognised that there was so much already going on. And I guess for me, there's a risk that this could have or could still be something of a distraction, a kind of new, you know, why plant a new flag? I've got no interest in, in sort of planting a new flag unless it can actually be a chance to regroup around this particular moment and think, rethink and re wave the flag for education, for open education, but wave it in relation to the challenges that we particularly face now. Um, and I think also, you know, the chance to do things differently. Uh, so open science is really well established, open education is really well established, but we do things differently. Um, we, we lean on slightly different parts of the value spectrum around open. You know, we maybe lean more to open practice, um, more to examining our open practice, perhaps, and the conditions of labour in open practice, a little bit less to things like um, open access publishing, although they're also important. Um, and the other piece for me, I'm going to shut up, this is really, this is the last thing I want to say really, but the other piece for me, I think, was um, elevating the discussion about public education in, in the same way the discussion about public health has been elevated. So the UNESCO, UNESCO put out this great report around about May, and I'll put the link in the chat window, called Education in a Post-Covid World, where they explicitly make that link between public health and public education by which they mean you know, publicly funded democratic forms of education, publicly funded democratic forms of healthcare. Um, we are only safe when everyone is safe, that this is what the virus has shown us, and we only flourish when everybody flourishes. And I think that last piece, those of us who care about democratic forms of education would want to assert alongside the assertion about um, how long it is to keep private knowledge private when people's lives are at risk. We would say, wouldn't we, it's also wrong to keep know-how uh, for, for, for closed business models when people's life chances are at risk, because people's life chances are also, um, also save lives and also create forms of life opportunity. So it was kind of explicitly making that link between health and education as both needing at this time uh, ways of recognising the value of open and the importance of open and the importance of public and democratic forms. And sadly, in, in recent months, in the UK at least, the two have been slightly counterposed to each other. So opening up schools and universities and colleges has been seen as a good, but it's been seen as a good that is in distinction to the good of keeping everybody safe. And that, it seems to me, um, is, it, is problematic. We need, to tr we, need to, we need to explain why actually keeping everybody safe and helping everybody to achieve what they can in life are actually in the long term one and the same thing and it's about doing education in a way that respects people's health and well-being and safety and it's about keeping people safe in ways that allow them still to aspire and reach out to the best they can be so i would say i was trying to kind of link those two together and and other people are as well so um yeah this is the kind of the two strands that came together into creating the pledge and since creating the pledge um lots of great and amazing things have happened in terms of people signing it, but they haven't quite been the people who I expected to sign it. So what I'd really love to do and we've got left is to um, ask this community really to help me explore what we might do next, what we might do differently. If this is a thing worth putting energy into as a community, if it had this moment, you know, I'm, I'm not attached to it being a particular thing. Um, and so it will be great to, to first of all, just have any thoughts and feedback on that. And then maybe to move into those um, these four areas that I thought we could look at, focusing particularly on number three, things we might do together. I'm going to be quiet for a minute and invite any comments and feedback. Thanks so much, Helen. This, this again, this is quite a um, uh, the the knowledge that you're sharing with us is is quite deep and takes a bit of picking through and thinking about and we're all coming at it from different places so i want to give people time to breathe and, and digest and think and there have been some links shared in the chat um to give people an idea um, of the sort of things that have happened in the past but i love the way that you connected um education into this conversation because as you say it, it, people's life chances are already being hugely impacted. Obviously, the first priority is to, to 
still be alive and it's very important that we're you know from a medical point of view that we're, we're doing everything we can there um, but we also want quality of life and uh, it's very important that we join these conversations together um, good to see lots of companies and uh, and actors actually getting involved um, but one of the things that I felt having felt a little bit sort of anxious about well who do I contact who do I encourage once I've signed it myself how, how do I influence my community and things that's kind of taken a while for me to process and you know even just last night you know oh I haven't contacted so and so and you know things gradually appear um, so yeah I think uh, it's important that we sort of think it through and uh, find these communities that we can reach out to and one of them that i've reached out to today has been the um open um alliance uh open recognition alliance um, and i hope they will think about this too please feel free to pop into the chat any of your reflections and thoughts while we just uh, take all of this on board and start to think about why the pledge is relevant and how it is to our own contexts. Thanks so much. I mean, my next slide actually did a little bit to answer Liz's really important question. So if it's OK, I will just um, allude to this issue about getting people involved. So what did I expect? OK, I expected um, more of the grassroots conversation. So I've put in there who's involved. Um, there's individuals and organisations, and we've kind of touched on what it what might mean to um, to be able to upload your organisation's logo, what kind of conversations that would entail. And I guess for me, that was what I imagined being the, the work of this, as far as it was doing any work on its own, that people who wanted to sign up to it would, would be having those quite difficult conversations within their own organisation um, about why, for example, um, our fantastic videos about support about supporting learners online might be might should be openly available but also how are how what we're learning from student panels and staff panels and internal surveys about our response the choices we've made around how to reopen or how to blend learning what we've learned should be should be publicly available because there will be organizations that are really well resourced we know universities that are running their own testing labs we know universities that are um, you know, well, like Edinburgh that's been mentioned, that have an incredible back catalogue of resources that they're um, supporting their staff to work through and use. And we know there's lots of organisations around the world that simply lack those resources and would hugely benefit from sharing. So I guess I was imagining more of those internal conversations with organisations that are generating know-how in the moment about how to respond. What happened instead, or as well, but a large thing that happened that I didn't anticipate was lots and lots of people with that open hat on and in their organisational mission and name wanted to sign and wanted to get involved. And that creates a different opportunity, which is the pledge might be something that allows a little bit more cooperation and a little bit more um, boundary shifting between some of those networks and some of those organisational um, activities, if you like, in this moment of COVID. And of course, it's not going to be the only one there's lots and lots of them but it might just be something that um, helps for that to happen but I think those two are different so the thing about helping organizations to collaborate more in this moment that already are committed to open is a really different project to helping individuals in their own setting have those difficult conversations about open and I certainly imagined the second and I didn't really imagine the first so I hope that that was helpful um, but it'd be really useful to hear from people who are in this room really how you think um, you could be involved or other organizations that have signed up might be asked to do specific things at the minute we say just sign the pledge upload the logo this is the conversation and then maybe write a blog post and join the discussion list. are there other things that we should could might be asking people to do at the moment they sign up which is going to be the moment when they have most openness is there a kind of format we could suggest for an internal conversation for example that might help people take that really difficult step from being personally committed to asking their colleagues and asking their organisation what they think about it. Any thoughts? It's good to see some interesting comments coming through on the chat. Um, so yes, we'll perhaps pick up on the chat and, and come back there. I, I, my personal feeling was when I've signed this pledge, is there some sort of visual that I can use on my 
website or whatever to show that I support the pledge just to raise the visibility and I think you you did find a way forward on that which would be great um we, you've also set up a gist mail list which I think is is a useful way of um, extending the conversation and asking the questions but I think it's your point on curation which really interests me because certainly as an open ed SIG we'd be very happy to support curation of the blog posts for example and um, share that message and make sure that it then becomes a page that can be um, shown that helps support the argument if people are taking taking the discussion further up the chain within their institutions um, helps to provide a sort of picture of the conversations that are going on um, let's just flip back so Catherine um, making things visible I think that's really important isn't it and that's I think that's a um, the the conversation about education being equitable equitable and equity within um, within these conversations and, and maybe that hashtag that we've tried many many times to get going which is the techquity hashtag to talk about how you make education equitable through the use of technology which in my personal set of circumstances I've seen actually move further into the distance uh, which is very worrying um, Scott, is there a reason why so many that have signed um, aren't here? Well, I think uh, probably the thing to mention there, Helen, is the fact that you've been having these conversations with the organisations just this week. Um, so people may well feel that they're not here because they've already had that conversation and they're sort of mobilising. Well, it's not. Uh, like, thanks, Teresa. I mean, it's not. Um... Yes, I don't want to dismiss that. So I feel that at the minute, as an individual, I'm going into lots and lots of spaces where there are about 10 people who want to have this conversation in that space. Uh, lots of them. Now, that's a problem. Um, because, you know, obviously Alt Open Ed SIG is a particular community and it's wonderful that 10 people from that community want to have this conversation. Um, then there are kind of more global players who want to talk to other global players about how they can collaborate together. It becomes a series of small rooms rather than a large conversation, which I do think is a problem. Um, and within that, I'm sure there are people who just see something like this happening and sign it and then forget about it. I'm absolutely confident that's going on. Um, you know, there's nothing anyone can do about that other than making being more actively involved something that's easy and rewarding to do and I guess my question is to the people here who seem to care enough to be here in your lunchtime you know what do you think makes it more meaningful and pragmatically useful and engaging for people to to get involved with um, so some of the thoughts that you know that have come up from the conversations I've had would be to have um, a rolling curation of the hashtag which is something that's happened really successfully in another network I'm involved with so different people or organizations might take on curating the hashtag for a week or for a longer period um, and that's very easy kind of fairly easy low-level commitment um, but it creates conversations it gets more followers and it creates um, kind of a very very open democratic kind of way of participating and then we might think about having more um, Close, more, more kind of time bound things like um, collaborative curation um, and, and times like weeks or months where we showcase content. But I'm just picking up what Liz is saying that there's so much going on. Um, I've kind of kept this quite low key because I felt that it really needed to build some um, resource behind it before we talked about doing anything more active than just the play itself. Um, but I'd be really up for other suggestions about things we might do that don't involve huge resources and commitment but that make it more more practically um meaningful for people who signed it you know what can we what demands could we put on people who signed the pledge what could we ask of them what could we suggest they do yes and i think that's the um to come back on liz's point as well and the fact that it is very busy obviously and everybody is rushing around doing things that uh, the the thing perhaps to throw into the mix is that actually you're not necessarily looking for things that take a lot of time so things you are doing already um how can you pop those into the public domain or how can you share them in a way where we can find them how can you curate them and as scott mentions you know let's let's see if we through perhaps curation of of what's happening um we can pull this together and it then supports us in our sort of promotion activities with open um so you're not just 
pointing to the same things all the time. You're seeing um, different actors in different roles. I think giving examples is really helpful. And I think the blogging idea is really, really helpful. Um, and the translation, I've got to say something about the translation, haven't I, obviously. So yes, we can certainly get, get the uh, um, pledge translated into French and Spanish. I think we should move that forward quite quickly. And That's Catherine, great. yeah. And we've got someone else who's um, keen on that, so maybe I could put you in touch. That would be really great. To do that. Excellent. Lovely. Um, there's a point here from Catherine as well around, you know, the various conferences, the Open Education Global Conference coming soon. Yes, how are we reaching them? Yes, and for me it would be great to have other people who are willing to talk about this um, because, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I mean, I should say at this point, I, you know, I, I, I'm just one person sort of trying to bring some threads together and, and uh, create a space for people to take on whatever they want this to be. Um, I've got no, I don't want to be identified with it personally in any way. I want other people to pick it up. And some of the bigger organisations are making noises that they might like to pick it up. But for the time being, I'm really keen to try and keep it as a grassroots kind of open network and just see what can happen through that. But obviously that means we don't have, for example, Creative Commons putting a huge amount of resource in. We do, as I must keep saying, we do have the alt, people at alt um, helping to upload signatories and doing the back office stuff, which I'm deeply grateful for. But if it's going to be actively promoted, we need more than that. Yes, Liz, um, some, and some libraries have signed, which is great. And I'm following everybody whose contact details I have. Yeah, I found that kind of, you know, even today I saw one of our collections being shared on Twitter and I thought, oh, sh should I follow up with the pledge and suggest it? It's difficult to know, you know, where where you tread on this and whether you, I mean, it, obviously it helps if somebody comes forward and says, oh, that's interesting, can you tell me more? But we will obviously use the webinar, the recording of this webinar as well to help people um, better understand what it, what the pledge involves and how... Um, open, if I come to Catherine's work, is contextual and it doesn't mean everything has to be open and it doesn't mean that you're not going to be paid ever again. Um, it, you know, it, it's very much down to how we interpret things. And I love the way the pledge is worded. Um, I think it's, it's really well put together in terms of, you know, leaving those options open so that people can think about what will work for them. And yeah, Liz, we'll give it a go. You, you're you're encouraging me. I'll give it a go. One of the things that I will just share is the blog post that I've just put in the chat window. Um, it, it addresses this issue, which which then begins to unpack, I think, some of the other issues we're struggling with or we're, we're wondering about. So I tried to address the question of what it is that might be shared which is something that the Open COVID pledge for science and medicine does really clearly. You know, it's kind of, it's, it's a lot of it is patents in their case. Um, we don't have patents in quite the same way. And of course, we have open access publishing in education. And just in a really basic way, um, you know, that I think um, that we could make requests to some education journals that we know that are not open access, that at least for the duration of or for um, the purpose of some issues that get discussed in their pages, making that material um, open and putting it outside the file for payment would be the right thing to do, you know, in the same way that lots and lots of um, uh, magazines and journals and scientific journals and non and non scientific have put COVID related content outside of their paywall simply because it's the right thing to do. So I think there's kind of stuff around open access we could think about. There's lots of open data sets that might be might be useful, and I mentioned a couple of the kinds that were happening. I think OERs for educators is. Um, in a sense, the problem there is not scarcity or lack of openness. The problem there is just the richness and variety of all the work that's been done over the summer to create how to videos and thought pieces, frameworks and you know, the rough and ready, the, the, the examples of practice. There's so much there. You know, is the pledge, uh, particularly if we kind of shared curation, is it a way for people to editorialise that a little bit from their perspective? You know, here I am. Um, I want to look at what's available under the Open COVID pledge that is going to really help solve this particular issue or work for this particular group of educators who have this particular problem. That, so, you know, I think that's where 
um, taking it in turns to create the hashtag might produce some kind of quite nice editorialized um, pathways through what is an absolute plethora of um, material relating to practice, which is so amazing. And um, so, so I think in thinking about what's there, it helps us to think about, well, therefore, what might we have to do? Um, and what might we do in, in relation to our existing networks, but also trying to just create a few links. So to re, um, Liz is talking about libraries. I think it would be great to create some links with the library network around this and with the open licensing uh, in, in, that, in that way as well. So I'm just really open to other ideas about, you know, given that in the open community, lots of this is out there, how we might help people find pathways through it as much as how might we have these conversations about bringing things to openness that are currently not open enough? I think both of those are kind of useful conversations to have. Yes, and it's been a really vibrant conversation in the chat, actually, which is probably because we haven't got mics for people, but I'm sure um, Deb would, would pass those if anybody wants to, to take a mic. Um, it, it, interesting to have this uh, this issue. I've always been keen on sort of you know the 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 podcast you could you could record, for example, just by having a conversation with other people in your space around what you're doing because of COVID. You know, just a 10 minute, 15 minute audio track. The the quick video capture of how to do X, um, which could be really useful for other people using similar technologies. Um, and I think it's interesting what Scott raises here about the conversations around institutional reputation, where I think I would point them directly at Edinburgh and the, and the work of um, uh, work on open that was done there with the Glasgow project as well um, that we've shared in the past. There are some really there are some real wins from a reputational standpoint from increasing openness just from a collaborative point of view and team building and understanding what other people do, we tend to work in our silos. I think another, I mean, I think another conversation that's worth having organisationally or worth thinking about is that we all know that at this time in particular, organisations are looking to their data platforms, to their digital platforms, to provide them with data for decision making. And an awful lot of um, vendors are, in a way, um, selling the selling platforms, new ones or existing ones, on the basis that uh, they will it will give you an awful lot of access clo to closed data. To closed data, you can own about how your students and staff are behaving. And I think the Open COVID pledge for me, if I was to put a little bit of a political spin on it, I think it would be a way of opening up a different conversation about what's worth sharing. So you know, as a university, it might be just as valuable for you to have. A rich conversation about how other universities have approached uh, non-engaged students, for example, as it would be to install the best dashboard to to monitor, you know, who they are and where they are. Now, I would say that, wouldn't I? But I think um, it's really important that we can use something like this to value all kinds of knowledge and know-how, not just data, you know, not just the findings from surveys, for example, and finding ways of bridging those across contexts, because I know Catherine would say a lot of that is very contextually embedded, um, then I think that, you know, that's uh, Scott, Christ, you're leading on learning analytics, you know, e exactly. And how are we sharing the, the pros and cons of that? An earlier slide, I had the, the, the heroes and villains narrative. Um, and I think what I hear is, um, you know, learning technologists in particular have been have been, you know, right in the middle of, um, of this narrative about what it is that learning technologists do. On the one hand, suddenly being the heroes of the of the story, and yet on the other hand, from from various perspectives that we all care about, there's huge worries about the, the impact of of uh, the rush to digital and of how new platforms are being installed and used. We, we all could just say Proctorio and maybe leave that one hanging there. So. Um, yeah, be yeah, be as villainous as you like, Scott. Um, I hope to see your cape on a future on a future outing. But I think if we want to get beyond that, we need to have a little bit more nuance about what we're actually learning about about the online pivot, and that requires an open pivot. So I mean, I would kind of say we can't have the online pivot without an open pivot. That means we're being more transparent about what we're learning. 
Um, I'm going to stop speaking because I've spoken a lot and it's quarter past. I know from Theresa you kind of often try and wind up here, but if there's appetite to go on talking, I'd be happy to stay a bit longer. Hi, Tess, lovely to see you there. So you two are a villain, okay. <laughs> Well, yes, I am. Uh, <laughs> I'll go to I learned I'm on with the bike too. Very much a hero there. Well, it's one of those things that um, you know, you, if you just go straight pragmatism, you need something, you know. And I work in. Um, I'm. I'm. That my my job title is no longer learning technologist, but um, but somebody's got to do it and. You know, so I work in medicine and that's high stakes. And so the way that um, the assessment uh, team think of it, if we don't, you know, make it secure, super secure, then how can we uh, tell, um, you know, the authorities that we really have prepared the doctors uh, to go out and practice? And I find it hard to argue against that. Thank you for sharing that, Therese. I guess my piece would be that what we are being asked to do, well, I, you know, what learning technology staff and learning technology teams and educators generally are being asked to do um, is evidence-based. And the pledge shows that we are thinking about our practice, we're reflecting on our practice, we're, we are sharing the research and the evidence about our practice. We are not just blindly um, rushing into doing what we're told to do, and nor are we kind of like the like the healthcare workers who were clapped for, you know, nor can we just be sacrificed on the altar of working 24 seven to make it happen. So, so I guess the piece there I would say is it's, it's evidence based, you know, that the practice we all engage with and value is an evidence based practice. And the Open COVID pledge says, just as you need ev evidence to practice successfully in public health at a time of crisis, you also need evidence to practice successfully in education at a time of crisis. And here we are, we're professionals, we're academics, we're intellectuals, we are evidence based. And this is a sign that we care to share the evidence and to, and to make use of it. Thanks. Absolutely. And thanks, Scott, for sharing that link as well around assessment and how assessment can be improved, because I think that's another important point. I, I think I'd, I'd always come back to Catherine's work. <laughs> She's too modest to say anything about it here. But, you know, when you think about um, what she taught us about open education, there are going to be things that can't be shared for uh, for reasons of privacy or security or whatever. That's that's always going to happen. But it, it is possible to edit, editorialize, as Helen said earlier, those things that are shareable um, and to, and to uh, help people think about other ways of doing things. We really can't. We're in a position where it, what has to be achieved far out, out stretches um, what any individual can do or any single organisation can do. If we're going to make a difference, we have to work collaboratively. And in order to collaborate, we have to get to know each other. We have to build trust. We have to speak to each other. So, you know, one of the one of the first ways I can see this moving forward is just breaking down some of those barriers and having some of those conversations. I think it's really helpful to be in that conversation. So thanks very much, Therese, for bringing along your um, your context as well to the discussion. And thanks, Catherine, for raising the issue UNESCO as well. Um, yeah, they are clearly a really important player in this, and, and I've been trying to get some of their uh, different teams to take an interest, and I think that might happen, which would be great. But even so, just pointing to the OER recommendation and pointing to their um, their recommendation for the future of education and their young people's declaration on the future of education as well, all of which links I will share on the discussion list after, after this, is really helpful. Please do join that email discussion list and we'll get some more open conversation going. I'll put that link in the chat window. Too.
Many thanks, um, Helen, for giving us, as Catherine has expressed there, a renewed enthusiasm and uh, just giving us the energy we need to pick, to find things that work for us. It's, you know, it, there is no one thing that is going to fit everything. But if we can pick up that open uh, COVID for Ed hashtag, sign the pledge, think of others that we know who, who might want to have that conversation. And that conversation may not translate immediately into action. Uh, but it, it starts the wheels turning um, and I think that's really important and I think it's very important as well that we encourage the students to get involved in this conversation. The vital message we have to give is that we cannot return to business as usual. Business as usual got us into the position we're in. We really need to rethink how we do things um, and find a new way of conceptualising business. Thank you. Theresa for hosting this it's been really really helpful oh great Therese it's good to hear that students are willing to get involved in that discussion Just, like, you know uh, to, to be to be thinking about doing medicine at a time like this uh, they, you know these young people have a huge respect and yes wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get the National Union students and yes I was delighted to see UCU had signed so I think that's, a, that's a, a great coup too that was great I was very pleased with that and um, and through that I'm, I'm working on getting Larissa to sign obviously the NUS has a huge amount on its plate but hopefully if the NUS signs it will mean that it'll be easier for having that you know for using it as a way to have that conversation locally or since the conversation I'm sure is happening in many places locally just you know emphasizing that that the that there is a shared value there. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and Kelly isn't with us at the moment, but I know Kelly's um, uh, work on uh, repositories also. It's relevant if you if you run and organise a repository, how are you making it easier for people with respective repositories to to look into yours and to share things, um, to share across teams, across institutions, and within departments across um, practitioners too. Thank you so much, Helen. You've really given us um, great inspiration and lots and lots of evidence. And uh, I think the encouragement to uh, to take this on board because it very much is, you know, something where we can all bring something to the table uh, together. Yeah. Just to emphasise that what this is is what you all say it is. So every time you blog about it, you make it something it's something different. It isn't anything other than what everyone who's signed it says that it is. So please do think of um, making it a little bit your own. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, I fully uh, support that. I'm just going to 